It's been pretty impossible to avoid the Israel-Palestine conflict since the October 7th, 2023 Hamas attack in southern Israel. Hamas's attack took the lives of military and security forces, but unfortunately also had civilian victims. It was a horrible loss of life and has been consistently called Israel's 9-11. One would hope we would learn from 9-11, but it seems that has not happened. After 9-11, the U.S. began a war in Afghanistan that lasted for 20 years and started another war in Iraq that led to the deaths of 1 million Iraqis in conservative estimates. Apparently, this is the talking point used to justify the slaughter of thousands of Palestinians in Gaza, which a large portion of them are children. The irony of this talking point is 9-11 was blowback to U.S. policy, so in that sense, it works with Israel. I say this because there is significant history leading up to this attack. Israel and its allies are trying to paint this as an isolated incident, but I'm here to tell you they're wrong. This video likely can be filed into the History We're Not Taught playlist, but I feel it will be more about pushing back on bad faith talking points. It will not be all encompassing, but I hope it will be enough to see through the propaganda. I will cover some background on the birth of modern day Israel, history we're not taught of this area, and some of the most common bad faith talking points. To provide fuller context to the situation, it must be said that Jewish people experienced severe anti-Semitism throughout Europe for centuries. The fall of the Roman Empire in roughly the 5th century led into the dominance of Christianity in Europe. Usury, or lending money with interest, is considered a sin within Christianity, but not within Judaism. It is important to add this context because Jewish people within Europe were severely discriminated against and were not given land rights or allowed to work within certain professions. As time bore on, customers began to default on loans and likely led to the grotesque stereotype of greedy Jewish people. This rise of anti-Semitism led to the expulsion of Jewish people from countries in Europe. At the time of these expulsions, Jewish people found homes in Arabic regions within the Middle East and North Africa, which included the Ottoman Empire. Within these regions, Jewish, Christian, and Islamic peoples lived side by side in relative peace for a few hundred years. Closer to modern times, the Ottoman Empire saw relative peace with these religions living amongst each other. After the fall of the Ottoman Empire, after World War II, Britain was given the mandate to Palestine. A Jewish homeland was mentioned in the mandate document without violating civil and religious rights to non-Jewish communities in Palestine. Britain oversaw Palestine through World War II until definitive borders were drawn for Israel and Palestine in late 1947 by the UN Partition Plan. The establishment of Israel occurred in 1948. Where did everything change? After World War II and the events that made up the Holocaust, Zionism or Jewish nationalism with the beliefs Jewish people must establish a Jewish state in the Palestinian region was seen as a tool for Allied forces to establish a forward operating base in the resource-rich Middle East and North Africa regions. Some would argue the establishment of the Jewish state within Germany would feel like proper reparations for the Jewish people. Exodus of Jews from Arab states occurred at this time. At the establishment of Israel, Zionist militias who were trained and supplied by British forces began the expulsion of Palestinians known as the Nakba. Nakba is defined as catastrophe in Arabic. 700,000 Palestinians were displaced or fled during this period. Palestinians still have their keys to their homes around their neck and carry the deeds to their lands in hopes they will return to their homes someday. Palestinians were stripped of arms by the British in the late 1930s after an uprising of the Palestinians to British occupation. Zionist militias committed atrocities in inadequately defended Palestinian villages. For example, Dair Yassin village saw 93 plus Palestinian villagers killed by Jewish forces. Their bodies were abused and numerous women were raped and killed. 30 of the dead were babies. Wounded Zionists were carried on beds and doors from houses by Palestinian women and elderly in hopes the Palestinian defenders would not fire in their direction. They were still hit despite being used as human shields. Historian Ilhan Pape documents on May 22, 1948, Israeli Defense Forces, also known as the IDF, massacred 110 to 230 Palestinian men. After the slaughter, the IDF gathered all the women and children to the place where they put the bodies to see their dead husbands and terrorize them. On October 28, 1948, Dawaye, a village near Hebron, 145 children, women, and men were killed. 450 went missing, including 170 women and children. On October 29, 1948, Safsaf village was assaulted by Israeli forces. After surrendering, 50 to 70 men were massacred while bound and four women were raped. These are only a few of the atrocities that occurred during the Nakba, which include expulsions, displacements, massacres, rapes, village annihilation, and other violence. This Arab-Israeli war resulted in 6,000 Israeli and 8,000 to 15,000 Arab deaths. After the conclusion of the war, Israel controlled 78% of Palestine, which was 25% more than the UN partition plan. The resulting armistice lasted until June 1967, when the Six-Day War began with Israel preemptively striking Egyptian Air Force targets after Egyptian escalation. Israel claims that they were on the cusp of Arab countries invading Israel. No evidence was provided for this. Jordan entered a defensive pact with Egypt a week prior. 
Jordanian forces slowed down Israeli forces, but Israel ended up occupying all of Palestine, which included the Gaza Strip, the West Bank, Golan Heights, and the Sinai Peninsula. This day is celebrated in Israel on Flag Day, with Israeli radicals parading through illegally occupied East Jerusalem, taunting Palestinians. After the 1973 Yom Kippur War, the Gaza Strip remained under Israeli military control. Israel withdrew from the Sinai Peninsula after a 1979 agreement with Egypt, with the withdrawal ending in 1982 after dismantling settlements in the Sinai Peninsula. In 2002, the IDF blew up the Gaza runway and haven't allowed materials into the Gaza Strip to rebuild it. In 2005, the IDF removed Israeli settlements from the Gaza Strip. At the urge of the U.S., an election was held in the Gaza Strip in 2006. The secular parties split the vote and Hamas won the election. A coup backed by the United States attempted to overthrow the Hamas-like government. Hamas successfully defended the coup and took control of the Gaza Strip. Israel and Egypt shut down and blockaded the Gaza Strip borders, with Israel controlling everything going in and out of the Gaza Strip, including its coastline. Between then and now, Israel would periodically lob rockets, bombs, and airstrikes onto the Gaza Strip, claiming preemptive strikes on Hamas and primarily killing civilians, including children. Israel also claimed attacks were in response to Hamas's rockets, where Norm Finkelstein will explain what these rockets are. The weapons are basically symbolic. They're the equivalent of fireworks. As uh, Khalid Michel put it at one point, the head of uh, Hamas at that moment, he no longer is, he says they're our cry to the world. You know, it's a kind of, if I can use my language, it's a kind of SOS. They're sending these flares into the air. SOS, we're dying. SOS, we're dying. That's not an exaggeration. When Mary Robinson from the UN High, Commission, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, when she went to Gaza in 2008, she said, a whole civilization is being destroyed. I am not exaggerating. A whole civilization is being destroyed. Okay. So if you send up flares saying SOS, we're dying, which have next to zero impact on civilians, next to zero, I think whether or not they're discriminate or indiscriminate, it's beside the point. From March 2018 to December 2019, Palestinians demonstrated on the Gazan border on each Friday. Originally created by independent activists, Palestinians marched towards the border, largely unarmed. IDF snipers took shots at women, children, and military-aged men. They also targeted medics helping the wounded. They lied about these actions and even doctored footage. They later claimed every bullet was accounting for, meaning they all hit or fired near their targets. With each Palestinian demonstration and uprising, there were asymmetrical responses from Israel with ever increasing violence dropped on the Palestinian people. It can be argued that this strategy has led to Hamas continuing to have support because of radicalization from constant violence perpetrated by Israel. In March 2019, Bibi Netanyahu defended his suitcases full of payments to Hamas to his own party by claiming that it's part of a broader strategy to keep Hamas and the Palestinian Authority separate. He says that maintaining the separation between the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank and Hamas and Gaza helps prevent the establishment of the Palestinian state. I'm unable to cover every instance of violence, but I hope a pattern can be easily recognized. So that is a bit of a background to where we've come today. Now I would like to further clarify or debunk typical talking points in this conflict. Gazans voted for Hamas, therefore they all support Hamas. The elections were 17 years ago. The average age of the Gazan Strip is 18 years old, with 47% of the population younger than 18 years old. For comparison, the United States population younger than 18 is 22%. If 47% of the population is younger than 18, most of them couldn't even vote at that time and still can't vote today. The Gaza Strip is an open air prison. This is true because there are border fences, checkpoints, a naval blockade, water and electric controlled by Israel, where 90% of that water is typically toxic and undrinkable. Palestinians cannot return to Gaza if they are able to leave. Israel routinely mows the lawn. This is a metaphor to cutting down all Palestinians. Why not weed the field to get rid of Hamas? If you're weeding the field, you're specifically taking out Hamas. But instead, Israel lobs rockets and airstrikes onto the Gaza Strip and kills Palestinian civilians. Why are civilian casualties accepted? Israel claims they know everything going on in Gaza. If this is true, why are hospitals and schools consistently bombed over the years? Here's every hospital Israel's bombed in the last 10 years. And schools, refugee camps,
Now Israel is saying that this hospital bombing wasn't them. And sure, they ordered all the hospitals in Gaza to evacuate three days before the bombing. And sure, the Al-Akhli staff said they got phone calls for three straight days before the bombing telling them to evacuate. And of course, there's also the multiple tweets Israel deleted shortly after the bombing and the laughably fake phone call Israel claimed to have intercepted between two Palestinian militants, the Al Jazeera investigation, which completely debunks Israel's claim that a Palestinian rocket bombed the hospital, the multiple military veterans that have said the projectile sounds exactly like a US manufactured missile. And of course, there's also the fact that Israeli generals and politicians have been promising to flatten Gaza for the last two weeks, saying there are no innocent civilians in Gaza. And yeah, they turned off all the electricity to Gaza, all but collapsing the hospital system a week before the bombing. And I know what you're probably thinking right now. Israel did it. But here's the thing. This is what experts call anti-Israel bias. Also, Israel bombed the building holding the Associated Press and other journalists. Do you really think those journalists wouldn't know that Hamas was located in their building? Israel also has every address, every phone number of every Gazan citizen. They specifically call those citizens and let them know that they are about to bomb their house. Journalists are also included on this list. There have been dozens of journalists slaughtered during this current conflict that Israel is dropping on the Gazans. Maybe Israel is targeting journalists to prevent articles like this one from the Israeli 972 magazine. In this scathing piece, the journalist found that the Israeli army knows exactly how many civilian casualties to expect for a particular target. They even got a quote stating, when a three-year-old girl is killed in a home in Gaza, it's because someone from the army decided it wasn't a big deal for her to be killed. Also, these are not random rockets. Everything is intentional. We know exactly how much collateral damage there is in every home. Israel is specifically targeting Palestinian civilians in the Gaza Strip, including journalists and their families. The West Bank does not have any Hamas presence. Why did the Palestinians experience consistent settler violence backed by the IDF and Israeli government? The settlements are deemed illegal by international law. Settler occupiers can legally be identified as terrorists. Why do settlements separate Palestinian villages? They are dividing and conquering the Palestinian villages to ensure that the villagers don't unite and rise up and defend their land, which they have the legal right to do. Another reason to divide villages like this, because if there's an international agreement to create a two-state solution, they want to make sure that Israel gets as much land as possible. And if the settlements are spread out as they are here, they will have to give that land to Israel. There are a lot of checkpoints because you can't tell the difference between an Israeli and a Palestinian. This is done to check the identification to verify if they're Palestinian or Israeli. You also need specific license plate because there are settler only roads. Unfortunately, this action of specific license plates also identifies Palestinian cars for settlers to terrorize. This has been a religious war over thousands of years. No, as I stated earlier, Jews, Christians, and Muslims lived in a relative harmony during the Ottoman Empire and prior. The introduction of Israel and Zionism created the conflict in the region. It was Jewish land 3,000 years ago. How far back do you want to go? 100 years is the Ottoman Empire. Do you want to give it to Turkey? What about the Roman Empire? Should we give Israel back to Italy? This is just a bad faith talking point to justify the brutalization of Palestinian civilians. There's a lot of manufacturing consent through Western media. Israel also funds a ton of the propaganda through lobbying, through politicians, as well as think tanks within the United States. The passive voice is seen in Western media like officer-involved shootings in the United States for police shootings. The headlines state that Israelis are killed while Palestinians died. How did the Palestinians die? Did they just pass away from a heart attack, you know, at the age of 10? Or they die because Israelis bombarded them? Another example of a headline is Palestinians break in the UN warehouse for food. It's Palestinians' food. They're literally starving because Israel would not allow any food or water into the Gaza Strip. The Western media takes the IDF and the Israeli government word as true. For example, the 40 beheaded babies at the start of the conflict was spread about throughout all mainstream media, except it turns out it wasn't true. Anti-Zionism is not equal to anti-Semitism. Thinking all Jews support Israel is anti-Semitic because Jews are not a monolith. Jewish people are at the forefront of anti-Zionism and against the Israeli government actions. There's Israeli citizens protesting the government and getting arrested. The loudest Israeli citizens are the families of the hostages because the Israeli government is killing more hostages than Hamas did. Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East. This is a bad faith talking point because Israeli citizens are being arrested for openly protesting government actions now. Israeli Jews are the only ones allowed to vote, be represented in the Israeli government. There are segregation laws within Israel similar to the Jim Crow laws, where neighborhoods are literally separated by walls. Israel maintains a single stratified population registry for everyone in Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories of the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and the Gaza Strip. At birth, Israel assigns each person an ID, and your ID determines your degree of freedom. According to Israel's 2018 nation-state law, only Jewish people have the right to self-determination in Israel. Over 50 Israeli laws discriminate against Palestinian citizens of Israel. For example, laws allowing for admissions committees can prevent Palestinian citizens of Israel from living in numerous small Jewish-only towns in Israel. 
After illegally annexing East Jerusalem in 1967, Israel assigned a residency ID to Palestinian inhabitants of the city, a precarious status that Israeli authorities can revoke at their discretion. Israeli planning documents for Jerusalem include an explicit goal of maintaining a Jewish majority in the city. Since 1967, Israel has revoked 14,500 IDs from Palestinians in East Jerusalem. An estimated 10,000 Palestinian children are unregistered due to the difficult process of obtaining a Jerusalem ID. In the West Bank, Palestinians carry a green ID. Palestinians with a green ID are only allowed to live on 40% of land in the West Bank. They face numerous barriers to movement and are barred from using certain segregated West Bank buses and roads designed to serve illegal Israeli settlements. Palestinians in Gaza are barred from living outside of Gaza, isolated from other Palestinian communities, and forced to live with the devastating effects of Israel's siege since 2007. Finally, millions of Palestinian refugees are excluded from the system altogether, since Israel denies their right of return. On top of that, the Israeli government and IDF sterilized Ethiopian Jews that immigrated to Israel. Within Israel, same-sex marriage is not allowed, neither is marriage between religions. Palestine rejected peace agreements as another bad faith talking point. Most, if not all, the agreements did not include Palestinian input. The agreements that included Palestinian input included the right to return to their homes within occupied Palestinian regions, and Israel rejected all of those agreements. Israel also undermined any Palestinian leader or group cooperating with Israel. They did this to decrease favorability and ensure Hamas was seen as the controlling party. Hamas ran as the anti-corruption party in 2006, and secular parties were seen as corrupt and split the votes. Zionist accusations are usually confessions. An example of this is the Palestinian liberation phrase from the river to the sea. Bad faith actors are claiming that this phrase of liberation is a call for Jewish genocide. However, the entire phrase includes Palestine will be free. This accusation is a confession because a majority of Zionists want to wipe out the entire Palestinian population. Zionists want to ethnically cleanse all Palestinians from the river to the sea and put in place Jewish people. Palestinians just want to live in their homes with equal rights, without fear of oppression. The oppressors usually have this fear that the oppressed will want revenge, while the oppressed actually just want equality. For example, American slavery, American civil rights, and the South African apartheid all had a fear that giving black people equal rights would lead to black people oppressing the white controlling party. Another example of the accusations are usually confessions are the baby killings. Killing children is atrocious enough. There's no need to embellish it. Baking babies in ovens accusations was actually done by Zionist militia during the Dyer Yesen incident that I spoke about earlier. أنا ماشي إبارك الحيط من مش من الشارع الرئيسي من البساتين الفرن إله شباك على جاء ولا اليهود في الفرن والنسوان عادات على الأرض كل واحدة عادة حط يديها على رأسها هي وبقوله للفران إرمي ابنك بالفرن إرمي ابنك بالفرن اسمه حامد قال لهم أنا ما برمي ابني قال له شوي هم ضربوا الحج حامد على رأسه ومسكوا الولد رموه بالفرن أنا شفت هالمن شفت هالمنظر ما تمش فيها حيل من مرة يعني بعدين مسكوا الأب حطوه وراه قالوا له ابنك they are saying the quiet part out loud to justify the brutality that they are dropping on the Palestinian head. I've offered a lot of context to this one-sided conflict. It's not all-encompassing because I can't cover every single event that has occurred, but I hope this provides a stepping stool to further research or at least some empathy for the innocent civilians being slaughtered. Someone claimed this to be a complex situation, but I think Michael Brooks' explanation is better. So it's not a complex issue. That's the big thing. It's super simple. There's one group that has enormous power. It's the most powerful country in the Middle East. It's backed by the United States. It acts on another population of people with total impunity and is never held accountable for anything. So there's no symmetry in the relationship, period. And just as like a thought experiment, IDW people, if we know that if somehow a population of Jewish refugees ended up in West Bank and Gaza and an Arabic government in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv had an open air prison in, in what, you know, Jewish Gaza, which they bombed with white phosphorus, they killed civilians indiscriminately, and they had no uh, provisions for medicine, they had an embargo that blocked food, that electricity wasn't running, that there was an over 48% unemployment rate, life expectancy and malnutrition statistics were horrifying. The, uh, one of the major uh, policy makers in this hypothetical Arabic Palestinian state said, we need to put those Jews on a diet. In the West Bank, there was another Jewish area where there was a little bit more autonomy, but there was regular Arabic settlements where they pulled up the Jewish farmers' foods, they terrorized them with rocks, the security forces broke children's bones, and they couldn't drive their own roads. We'd all have no problem understanding what that was. So there's nothing complex about it. The second part of your question, it's, it's a pure asymmetry relationship. And the question is rights or not. So that's it, it's not complicated. Israel is an apartheid state. As long as Israel continues to be an apartheid state, the ethnic cleansing and genocide will continue. Palestinians are human beings and they deserve equal rights on top of having basic human rights and dignity. Be sure to like, subscribe and hit the bell.